Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I want to wish you all a happy 2012. Welcome back to the show. We have a very important guest here today. His name is Dr. Thomas Levy. He is the author of Uninformed Consent, The Hidden Dangers in Dental Care, along with Hal Huggins, The Roots of Disease, Connecting Dentistry and Medicine, Stop America's Number One Killer, Curing the Incurable. And today we're going to be talking about his newest book called Primal Panacea, overwhelming documentation that proves that in high enough doses, vitamin C prevents and cures cancer, heart disease, infectious and degenerative diseases, and can neutralize and even reverse damage from virtually all toxins, venoms, and radiation. He's a cardiologist with a huge background in medicine. He says in his book, In Primal Panacea, that there are seven medical lies that kill. I want to name them for you because this contextualizes the essence of his contribution with vitamin C. The first medical lie that kills is that there are no vitamin C studies. The second one is that there's no evidence that vitamin C works. The third one is that vitamin C is not safe. The fourth is that vitamin C causes kidney stones. The fifth lie is that vitamin C needs are met by normal dietary intake. The sixth one is that high-dose vitamin C makes expensive urine. And number seven is if vitamin C worked, we'd all be using it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Thomas Levy, MD, JD, who's going to blow your mind about how important vitamin C is and a brand new form of delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Thomas Levy to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Hi, Kim. Good morning. I'm glad you're having me on the program. I don't know what I would do if I were you. In possession of your professional experience, your broad, deep-level research, your many years of work and study with Dr. Hal Huggins, who we've had here, and what you see in terms of factual evidence of the contribution of vitamin C, I don't know how it would be to be you, but I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. (laughs) Well... Sometimes it's good to be in my shoes and sometimes it isn't. So I I think I understand where you're coming from. I know that this goes on with different vitamins and minerals. Sometimes somebody does so much research like you that it looks like that vitamin or that mineral, just its essence can cure all these diseases. And some people just don't buy it. And yet you present so much factual evidence. The first thing I want you to talk about, if you wouldn't mind, is that when we're talking about vitamin C, you're really talking about the high-dose vitamin C, and you're talking about a dose-specific truth. Am I correct? Absolutely. I mean, it's healthy to eat fruits and vegetables, uh, and they all have vitamin C, but the amounts of vitamin C that those fruits and vegetables have uh, only scratch the surface when it comes to the things that vitamin C and other potent antioxidant supplementation can do when you dose it high enough. Is it true that most vitamin C that the public is familiar with at a consumer level is either the wrong kind of vitamin C or being delivered the wrong way? And if so, why? Yes, that is largely true. Uh, For one thing, the doses of vitamin C that even most people take in supplements, while it does good, and I don't want to discourage people from taking vitamin C at any dose because A little is a heck of a lot better than slim to none. Uh, But the form in which you take it is also important because vitamin C, unfortunately, is not that well absorbed as you take higher doses. And so much of the information in the book comes from studies that have been done with people taking vitamin C by vein, Uh, along with the fact that we now have some oral preparations that are what we call encapsulated in liposomes that are absorbed extremely well and delivered inside the cells. Uh, However, the regular vitamin C that most people take, although definitely of great benefit, and if you take it persistently, uh, multiple doses uh, when you're sick with a cold or flu, almost certainly you'll reduce the the duration of that illness dramatically, it still doesn't represent the type of benefits that can be obtained 
when you're able to get a hold of truly high dose vitamin C that as can be given by vein or taken in a liposome encapsulated preparation. For example, someone had told me, doctor, that when you take traditional vitamin C in the U.S., that a lot of it is from China. Is that correct? Oh, gosh. In this country, a lot of everything's from China. I know. <laughs> yes. yes, that's true. A lot of it comes from China. Uh, I want to say it doesn't mean per se uh, it's not good vitamin C. Uh, the only thing you have to concern yourself with uh, when dealing with any sort of supplier is is the integrity of the supplier and that what you're being sold is is what you bargained to buy. Uh, I've dealt with a fair amount of vitamin C over the years from China, uh, and I've had very good results, and, and I have no reason to believe or to make people afraid that if it says it's from China, they're not getting any value in the product. Uh, having said that, <clears throat> there are certainly higher quality ways to make it, uh, and purify it, uh, and make sure that you're getting, shall we say, the biggest bang for your buck. But but being from China per se doesn't doesn't mean you're not getting something good. There's just been a lot of news about dog food, baby food problems from China, all kinds of supplier problems. So that's why I wanted to ask you about that. But what are the blood levels of vitamin C since we don't make it? And I thought it was very interesting that most of the animal kingdom makes high levels of vitamin C, but we don't. Why do you think we used to make vitamin C and that we don't anymore? Well, that has to do with the nature of mutations. And uh, somewhere along the line, because we know very clearly from very solid and reproduced research that there's a four enzyme sequence inside the liver of the human as well as in many animals <clears throat> in which you take ordinary glucose or blood sugar and convert it in four steps to the vitamin C molecule, ascorbate. Now, in human beings and in a very limited number of animals, specifically primates and, and certain bats, that enzyme that converts in the fourth step the remaining product of vitamin C uh, is deficient to absent, <clears throat> in most cases absent. And what's interesting is it's what we call a point mutation, and anybody that studied any genetics know that point mutations can, re can reverse. They can mutate forward, and they can mutate back to the normal form. So <clears throat> although it's not covered that extensively in the book, I actually believe, and there was actually an early study, I believe in the New England Journal of Medicine, in which they wanted to see how long it took to make quote, ordinary people become severely enough vitamin C deficient to develop scurvy, the deficiency disease of vitamin C. And so they took six people, young people, and did everything they could to deplete the vitamin C from their, <clears throat> from their regular diet. Well, uh, four of them, after about uh, three or four months, started showing the signs of scurvy and, and had virtually no measurable vitamin C anymore in their urine, but two people continued to spill vitamin C in their urine. Now, what was probably even more amazing than this is rather than trigger some sort of scientific curiosity that, aha, we've discovered a percentage of people that are able to make vitamin C, they just cut those two people out of the study because that wasn't what they wanted to look at. But the impact of this is that I can't give you a percentage, but I think there are a substantial number of people that to a limited degree uh, can make some vitamin C in response to stress and toxins and infections. And I would submit to you that this probably accounts for some of the uh, peoples and different cultures that we know that survive a very long period of time. Uh, this is why some people, I believe, live healthy well into their hundreds while as others die in their 50s and 60s of heart attacks and cancer. <clears throat> so, but coming back to your original question, why did it all occur? I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. We, we, anytime you get a mutation genetically, what determines whether it persists or not uh, is generally considered to be whether or not uh, you give a survival advantage to that mutation. 
I certainly don't know of any survival advantage that uh, losing your ability to vitamin C makes, but it does appear uh, 